too much factual information. Uh, <laughs> but I have to say that each time I, uh, like, even before I moved here, I would go to his talks on the conference and I would always know this is the moment where you have to really concentrate and it's going to be incredibly interesting. And it's going to be like really uh, pretty complex but really interesting at the same time. With really interesting results, a lot of data that were very well, that's very well analyzed. And uh, so I know you as a more like as a biologist, uh, but you are of course a scientist too and a typologist. And most of all, typologists. And uh, I was supposed to say that every time uh, one of your articles appears in uh, what what journal? Um, typology. Uh, it's an event. And uh, and I'm sure that's true. <laughs> so um, I'm uh, very excited to hear more about this project, which I've heard a bit about earlier, but it's probably gone on again to unknown. Um, uh, and no, that, that's, that's, uh, that's almost enterprise, enterprise as citation. Go on to realm as unknown or something. Um, and uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to your time. Thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to start by, first of all, by saying thank you to the organizers of this great summer school for the honor and pleasure uh, I have Mm -hmm. Not only and primarily, not primarily presenting here, but being here and being able to, to at last learn something really very interesting and important. Um, well, coming to what I'm going to present, unfortunately, it's really nothing new, at least nothing new for me, because I'm not going to say anything I haven't actually said or written before. And there are some references to my own work and to my work joint with Andrei Shulinski. And all, all this stuff that is available online, um, somewhere on Academia EDU or on the website. And, well, actually, um, well, those of you who, who, who would prefer to enjoy the nice weather at last, please feel free to do it. Um, because, well, again, as I said, I'm not going to, to tell you anything really tremendously exciting. Um, and, um, well, nevertheless, probably listening to, well, peace for some of you, probably listening to a one hour plus something talk in English might be more exciting than reading a 300 page book in Russian. So, um, well, that's the roadmap, and I sort of hope to get through all of it. Um, especially because what clearly relates to what's more, most interesting in the context of this summer school is of course the last one. Um, but nevertheless, first we have to get a clear idea of what, what's the empirical domain I have investigated. And you know, well, you know, another point I want to add that to, to the previous part, the pre-introductory part, is that unfortunately this is even not a work in progress. This is something I'm sort of not intending to pursue any further, well, unless something persuades me to. Um, rather, something I'd, I consider, well, <coughs> not being modest enough, I consider an important, an important result of my work, which I sort of throw to people who certainly can and probably should do more than that. So, um, first of all, about the Slavic style aspect, and first, some very general words about aspect in general. 
So according to most influential definitions from well, everywhere, aspect is a grammatical system expressing the different ways of viewing the internal temporal constituency of a situation. Well, of course, is classic book. And languages differ tremendously as to which, if at all, spectral meanings are grammaticalized, which of them form a position and how are uh, these meanings are grouped together and how they are expressed. And there are plenty of literature, well, huge Himalaya size amounts of literature mm -hmm. about it. Um, a bit of theory. In my work, uh, I assume the so-called two-component theory of aspect, which draws a, um, an important and robust and, well, let me put it this way, an axiomatic distinction between two types of semantic content related to this domain. When I say axiomatic, it's important because there are theories of aspect which have, which do not do that, which do, which do not assume that there are more than one um, type of meaning, type of linguistic information associated with aspect, and that's a matter of that's that can be probably an empirical matter, and some claim that it is indeed an empirical matter, but sometimes it's, it, sometimes certain things which we assume should actually be viewed as our axioms. Something which is not necessarily, uh, which not necessarily can be proven um, in the mathematical sense of the word. So, I assume the two-component theory of aspect which distinguishes between the so-called viewpoint aspect, that is particular ways in which the speaker construes the situation he or she is talking about and relates it to other situations in discourse, uh, versus the so-called actionality, or to use the also an accepted but much more awkward term lexical aspect that is partly lexically encoded and partly syntactically determined linguistic categorization of situations. And actionality cons is concerned with such distinctions as dynamic versus static, durative versus functional, telic versus atelic, etc. etc. And there are plenty of theories of actionality, whereas viewpoint aspect uh, is a very broad domain, but I will be concerned with very mm, rough and very, mm, well, sort of a universal distinction <coughs> between uh, what is usually called perfection and imperfection. Um, and I understand perfective as mm. as a mode of viewing the situation as including as included into the reference time, into that reference interval, uh, or the topic time as Wolfgang Klan uh, puts it. Uh, together with its temporal boundaries uh, versus imperfective, that is viewing the situation as unbounded and overlapping with reference time or including or properly including the topic time into it. Into it. Um, and what is important is that these are all semantic notions. If you like, these are comparative concepts in, well, husband not style comparative concepts. These are not uh, 
language particular grammars. So on this slide, perfective is, a, is some kind of universal semantic mean or universal semantic operator, not necessarily uh, <coughs> corresponding to, well, Arabic perfect or Slavic perfect. Languages differ in how they treat all these and other things in their grammar, if at all. Well, this is very, very crude picture of how actionality and viewpoint aspect are independent of each other and combined with each other in two very different languages, English and Russian. And the only thing I would like to point out on, on this slide is that, well, Russian implores some sort of morphology to signal its perspective aspect. And this, this is precisely what I'm going to focus on later. So, getting to Slavic style aspect. This is the term coined by Ostendahl in his classic 1985 book called <laughs> Systems. Uh, and the term was coined to cover the aspectual systems of languages sharing the following characteristics derived from the knowledge of how Slavic aspectual systems work. So, perfective and imperfective are not part of the inflectional system of the language, while in the same sense as, for instance, passissant and imperfect are parts of the inflectional system of French. But rather, they are productive derivational categories. And here, I I have to add, well, a caveat that let's assume that we sort of understand what inflection and productive derivation is and how they are distinct. I will say some words about it. Um, and I must confess that at this point I'm sort of contradicting myself because elsewhere I write and say that inflection and derivation are probably not really meaningful terms, especially for topological research. Nevertheless, uh, <coughs> with respect to aspect, we can try to pinpoint certain properties which might mm -hmm. help make these terms, mm -hmm. well, adjust these terms to to, to um, particular empirical phenomena which are better defined. So, um, another important point is that simplex verbs in <coughs> such aspectual systems are imperfective. Um, well, they are predominantly used in the context of imperfective aspectual viewpoint and in addition to that um, they can be viewed as denoting atelic events such as processes and states whereas perfective verbs um, denoting events, notably denoting combinations of telic processes or derived from simplex verbs by means of lexically selective perfectivizing elements such as, for instance, prefixes or verbs. And I will use the term preverb uh, further on to refer to this type of aspectual marker. So, a couple of examples coming from different languages. So, Slavic in Russian we have Rezal, roughly meaning something by you or he was cutting. But if we want to express that 
someone cut something into two or more pieces, we have to use the prefix word razem. Um, basically the same in Lithuanian Baltic language, skaten is what's reading. Whereas if you want to say that someone read something through, we have to use the prefix word aske. Similarly, in Yiddish, in Germanic language, similarly in Hungarian, a Uralic language, and also in Caucasus, uh, in Georgian, as is an imperfective word meaning is denoting a process of writing, whereas if we want to express a complete event, of writing something up, we have to use uh, the prefix verb with the prefix verb da, that's a wrote up. And similarly in ascetic, a Indo-European, Iranian <coughs> language or the whole. So, what's all this? It's actually nothing really new. Um, People have known about it for quite some time. And uh, in another classic work, the work by John Barbie and Kirsten Dahl, and also by John Barbie and her associates, uh, a very useful distinction between two broad types of perfective, perfectives has been introduced. The one between the so-called bounder-based perfectives versus anterior-based perfectives. Um, here's a table opposing these two. Well, of course, these two as whole typological categories, these two are idealized types, not something which is directly instantiated in individual languages. So, bounder-based perfectives Historically, go back to combinations of verbs with adverbial elements, for example, here are the perfective perfectives, rather go back to resultant and perfect constructions. Uh, Bounder based perfectives tend to be derivational with all caveats associated with this verb, whereas anterior based perfectives tend to be inflectional. Bounder based perfectives show lexical idiosyncrasies and often add meanings other than just telling you that the verb is perfective and that's something which well, clearly goes with their derivational status <coughs> whereas anterior based perfectives tend to be semantically compositional well to the extent um, graphs whose uh, semantic import is as important as aspect can be compositional. And finally, uh, Barbie, Dahl and their associates say that actually bounder-based perfectives tend to express a little bit, well, express semantics a little bit different from that which anterior-based perfectives normally express there is the emphasis completion and not just temporal boundedness, whereas anterior based perfectives express temporal boundedness per se. That is, in other words, if we recall the definition of perfective and the perfective aspect, we can probably say that anterior based perfectives correspond more closely to the uh, comparative concept of perfective aspect than, than border based perfective too. Um, importantly, and that's something something a little bit more new, border based perfectives themselves constitute only one subtype of a spectral system which can be called again, roughly and crudely, 
generational or, to use another term introduced by Vladimir Plotian, who incidentally has his birthday today as well. <laughs> um, or, so to use his term, verb classifying a structural system. And if I have time, I will talk about it a little bit later, that boundary-based aspectual systems are just a subtype of, of verb classifying of the order-based aspectual systems. It's not the case that all that, well, boundary-based perspectives and anterior-based perspectives simply exhaust all the range of possibilities. It's not the case. Um, so, again, in derivation of spectral systems, a spectral interpretation, that is, what, a, what the verb means is, well, the viewport, the spectral viewport the verb expresses is perfective or imperfective, is an inherent property of the verb lexeme, and not something which is associated uh, with a particular form or set of forms. And in order to apply a different viewpoint to the same situation, a new verb has to be derived by morphological means. And basically there are two processes. One we have, which we have already seen, perfectivization, like in the Lithuania Skaititi, read, read, versus per Skaititi, read through, we add a prefix and we derive a perfected verb from an imperfected verb. But of course, uh, we can do the reverse if we need. That is imperfectivization, whereby an imperfected verb is derived from a perfected verb by means of something. And in Lithuanian, this something is a suffix. So we have irodite to prove um, a perfected verb, and irodinete, an imperfected verb, is to argue, that is to, well, to be busy proving, so to say. Um, and Lithuanian is one of the languages which have both perfectivization and imperfectivization. And importantly, believe it or not, many languages have only one of these. Um, well, one, that's actually what one of the criteria whereby we can at least try to tease apart inflectional versus derivational spectral systems. So, being a separate lapsing and a spectral deriv derivative is at least expected to display a full verbal paradigm and not just some particular form of forms. So in Lithuanian, um, Lithuanian is a good example of this. Russian is much worse. Because in Lithuanian, regardless of whether you are a perfected verb or a perfected verb, you have full verbal paradigm with all tenses, all participles, all whatever they have. And um, it's, yeah, it's seen here, so inflectional endings corresponding to the tenses are just the same, no gaps. And the difference between the perfective and imperfective verbs um, is completely orthogonal to to the temporal morphology. Again, this is the ideal case. Unfortunately, not all languages are as ideal as the twin endings. And those of you, well, those of you who know Russian, most of us actually, know that Russian is not as well made. Uh, another important point is that um, syntax verbs, that is verbs which do not have any, any 
special morphological marking um, can actually be both perfected and imperfected. So the absence of a particular derivation of marker does not necessarily entail a particular spectral meaning. So the Twainian verbs vesti and mesti are similar in all relevant respects. They belong to the same conjugation class, um, etc., etc. But somehow vesti is imperfected, whereas mesti is perfected, which can be seen in their behavior. And again, those of you who know Russian certainly know can come up with similar cases from Russia. Um, so, now close, clo more clo closer to Slavic. Um, in the Slavic languages, the spectral categories have been considered to be grammaticalized to the greatest extent. Um, and people say that this is because Slavic languages have secondary imperfectivization alongside perfectivization, uh, kind of entailing that the spectral position has been become, has become obligatory and has under, undergone perfectivization. Um, Slavic languages are famous for having so-called so empty prefixes, that is prefixes that in their particular usages do not introduce any tangible meaning apart from making the, making the verb perfective, that is, which is a hallmark of what characterization <coughs> people call semantic legion. And finally, and probably most importantly, uh, in terms of syntax and semantics, well, largely in terms of syntax, uh, Slavic languages show a nearly complementary distribution of aspects across certain, at least certain contexts, which are partly defined in grammatical rather, rather than semantic terms. In Slavic, it's a strict grammatical rule um, that you're not supposed to use a perfective verb after a phasal verb, which entails that if you want to express a particular meaning, you have to use some kind of, of, of an imperfective verb, which, which in turn sometimes entails that you have to derive that verb by means of productive imperfectivization. Um, so, you know, secondary imperfectivization in Slavic is something which should be shown. So um, you can have beset for instance in Russian, you can have beset, derived, you can derive or pit drink. Um, from pisat you can derive for pisat, which is clear that derivation because, because lexical meaning changes what besides is sign. It's not the same as right. Um, with vipit, it's different. Vipit is admittedly a purely perfected derivative of pit drink. Um, however, in both cases, uh, so, yeah. In both cases, um, it's possible to derive secondary imperfective verbs from uh, the perfective ones by means of suffixes. And uh, importantly, in both cases, uh, the, semantic the semantic contribution of the proverb uh, remains intact. That is, uh, the secondary imperfective of from what we said still means sign, but is it's, it's used in a different morphosyntactic context. And similarly, uh, uh still denotes 
something having to do with drinking things completely. So it's sort of monotonic. Um, Antiprefixes, well, this slide simply shows that, uh, in, that perfective counterparts of different imperfective verbs in Russian have different prefixes. And it is certainly possible, and many people have shown that, that a choice for the prefix is certainly not random. It is determined by the original lexical meaning of the prefix and the, by the lexical meaning of the verb, sometimes in very intricate ways, and several languages actually differ as to which prefixes they choose for which verbs. But it's important that there isn't any single prefix which, which is used with all verbs, and I don't even really think that it's possible to single out any default prefix which is used are just across the board. Mm. Okay. And finally, for the Britonimus, at least in Russian, if you need to express such things as, as iterativity or habituality, you ought to use an imperfective verb. An imperfective verb, even if every single event you are expressing is completed. So a single event reading, like Ivan Kochetov's that's used at the righteous cell with the uh, temporal verbial indicating attainment of the combination, Ivan read the paper in two hours. If you want to embed it into a habitual or iterative context and keep that verbial, you have to, you still have to use are uh, imperfective aspect. And well in Russian actually yeah so uh, in this example Ivan Lubu states you by cheetah you see a secondary imperfective. But in fact in Russian, at least in this particular sentence, it's not necessary to use a secondary imperfective, it's possible to use a <coughs> Well, it's it probably should speed up a little bit. Um, what is important um, in the context of this summer school is that there is a considerable cost linguistic variation in this domain, even across Slavic languages. Studies on particular study languages, and especially studies, in studies aiming at cross-slavic comparison, have shown that there are differences in the productivity of secondary imperfectivization across slavic languages. There are differences in the choice and productivity of the so-called empty prefixes, and most notably there are differences in the distribution of aspects in many contexts. It's not the case that Slavic languages use their aspects in identical ways. But sometimes the differences between different Slavic languages are quite, quite, mm, quite huge. Um, and this will imply that actually the semantics of aspectual categories in individual Slavic languages also differ. Moreover, if we return to the broader picture I have shown some time ago, um, well, we know that, linguists know that there are parallels to Slavic spectral systems in the mostly found in the neighboring languages. Um, yeah, I've already shown. Lithuanian, Hungarian, Yiddish, Ascetic, and Georgian. Um, and actually, it has been shown in recent work, including my own work, 
that not all of the features traditionally associated with Slavic aspect are found in other languages with a similar kind of spectral system. And, well, to be honest, that's not surprising, isn't it? Is it? That's actually what is to be expected. Different languages are expected to be different. But it's, you know, it's fun and it's instructive to try to learn, try to understand in which particular ways they are different. And try to figure out whether they differ in random ways or in some systematic ways. So, the questions I have asked in my work are, well, which properties are common to all Slavic style spectral systems and which are parameters of variation? <coughs> and even more importantly, do these properties cluster in any meaningful way? <coughs> and finally, and that's the question which is most exciting for me, how did the observed distribution of such systems about. And I will try to address these questions in the, rest, in the rest of this talk. Actually, how, how much time do I still have? Okay, yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. I'm wondering um, whether there are any really burning questions to be answered at this point rather than some time later. Yes, please. Uh, what is the difference in the meaning between uh, perfected, pre present perfected and preterred perfected in the table? Yes, so in the table that there are both. So yeah, well, uh, that's, the answer is simple. simple. Uh, you'll see it a bit later. Okay. But thank you for being attentive. Mm -hmm. Any other burning questions? Okay, then I'll go for that. So, um, a little bit of typology. The approach, I assume, is a multivariate approach. So, to refer to one of the numerous papers by Martin Zabikan and also some other people, uh, there is a, well, a productive way to, to um, compare complex linguistic phenomena, such as, for instance, spectral systems. And spectral systems are one of the most complex linguistic phenomena. Uh, so the productive way to compare them across languages is to first decompose them into a number of individual features which can be viewed as variables of cross-linguistic variation. Um, and this decomposition is empirically driven. So if you look at languages, and see differences between them and encode these differences as variables of your topology. Um, and then you well, then you encode the difference the different values of these variables or parameters or in some uniform way for the languages of the study and apply some quantitative and certainly qualitative uh, methods to analyze uh, to analyze their, their distribution for instance to analyze the patterns of their clusterization um, and actually you know, I must confess that, that probably this you know, I thought of saying it in the very beginning, 
that probably this talk is going to be the most old school and old fashioned talk <laughs> of, of the plenary talks at the school because I'm going to offer you any really sophisticated quantitative analysis, analysis um, and will show you some really ugly old old fashioned linguistic maps and that's all. And most of the interesting stuff is quantitative. Um, so, um, a little bit of self-advertisement. Self um, in the already published work, uh, either I alone or together with a co-author Andrei Shulinsky offer a multivariate topological, multivariate topological analysis of respect for the prefixal perfectivization and more broadly generational spectral systems employing a little bit of quantitative methods and much more of qualitative analysis. Um, so, and I'm going to I'm going to to focus on on uh, prefixal perfectivization um, and to most probably skip or or um, condense the broader part that is also quite interesting. So <coughs> the languages I have examined are well more or less all languages which have been reported to have uh, this sort of a spectral system mm. that is major Slavic languages including vernacular Abbasorbian with all areas pertaining to the fact that dialects are known to be different from standard languages and that uh, not actually being a real Slavicist, I, I don't, don't feel ashamed confessing that I don't read Czech, for instance. And therefore, I, yeah, I don't. And therefore, I, 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 don't, I can't uh, go into, uh, into the literature on Czech dialects and see what I can find there, etc., etc. Well, actually, I was much more interested in these other languages, in those languages which have not been studied, uh, whose spectral sy systems have not been studied in such detail as the Slavic ones before. Uh, so the Baltic languages and Yiddish with, and I also include German, as a point of reference, as a language, well, one cannot talk about Yiddish without including German, and certain Hungarian, and certainly ascetic, mostly Iran ascetic, because there isn't enough data on before, and they are, anyway, they are similar enough. And also, all, well, all the four Katrina languages on which data is available in languages other than Georgian because, again, I must confess that unfortunately I don't read Georgian either. Uh, and also, some uh, just for fun and just because I have worked on it and like it very much, a big game of West Circassian, a Northwest Caucasian language with lots of proverbs, but no perfectionization. Do you have a really burning question? A really burning question. Yeah. It is sometimes claimed that uh, Northern Semitic or Semitic in general also have a Slavic-like system. Um, well, it's part of of of, uh, of the broader topological outlook because Northern Semitic are imperfectivizing languages rather than perfectivizing ones, so they don't fit into this picture but I fit into the broader picture. So if I have time, most probably I won't have, but you have a documentation, uh, I will say a couple of words.
words of property. Um, so that's a kind. That's the kind of maps I use. Sorry. Um, I attended this course, but I have software problems, so I couldn't. I couldn't. Uh, even if I had time, I couldn't. Uh, couldn't improve my maps. Um, but well, that's that's actually a map with a decent history. It's it's a Eurotex style map, so. Mm. Nothing too bad. Um, my sources, again, my sources are rather painful, aren't they? They're mostly grammars and specialist studies of aspect. Also, dictionaries when I needed them. A very little corpus work. Actually, well, mostly only for Russian and Ukrainian. A little bit for some other languages, but nothing really extraordinary. And almost no field work, again, only for Lithuanian. And for a bigger, but a bigger is very different. And so, um, that's a suggestion. Um, there are power corpora. There is Ruprecht, who is who knows how to do power corpora research probably better than most other people in the world. And why not try to do something of this kind on the basis of power corpora? I'm not up to it. But anybody in this room or elsewhere is welcome to do it. Um, so, okay, um, do this. Um, so, my topological parameters come from different, um, or pertain to different domains, actually. Um, I'm interested in morphology of these uh, nice things I call pronouns. I'm interested in their functional semantic properties, and last but not least, and probably most importantly, I'm interested in how the global systems structured by means of proverbs function more broadly. And I can certainly spend the rest of this talk showing you some particulars of this study. So I'm, I'll be skipping, I'll show you a couple of examples, and then we'll be skipping things. <coughs> so, well, for instance, um, it is well known that some, in some languages, proverbs are separable, like in German, um, or in Yiddish. In other languages, they aren't. In Slavic languages and Baltic languages, they aren't. Um, and so here's the map. Um, and you see that actually things are not so simple. Um, there is a sort of a cluster in, in the West of languages which have separable proverbs. German and Yiddish, that's not surprising if they are close relatives. Hungarian, probably somewhat more surprising, unless we know its history. And surprisingly, Swan, a completely an outlier, and Hasidic, and Iranian language. So we see that morphological properties can cluster, but can also not cluster. No? No. 
Um, that's another interesting subject. Like, what are you, what are it's about, what are your language allows you to have more than one, one prevalent in a verb? Speakers of Slavic languages actually are lucky to be allowed to do so because most other, other languages don't allow it. Um, do you actually see that iteration of proverbs is a standard feature plus some, a little bit of it is, is available in Latvia to, for the master of standard Slavic and also in a bigger. You don't find it in the Caucasus, you don't find it in Hungarian, and you don't find it in Lithuanian, which is similar to Slavic languages in many respects, but not in this respect. And so on and so forth. So um, I'll skip this. Um, so I'll also skip this. That's, that's interesting. Um, it turns out that in some languages, verbs with prefixes and no further, no, without any further imperfectivization, can sometimes be used um, imperfectively. Usually only in the present tense, but it depends on the language. So in Georgian, uh, it is Commonly assume that in Georgian um, proverbs do not perfectivize verbs of motion. Like share ketebs is a perfective, it's is a perfective verb because a ketebs is a do and it's not a motion verb, but shedis is an imperfective verb because the base verb is a verb of motion. Um, the vernacular upper Soviet is still trickier because it's reported to allow imperfective use of virtually any prefix verb, something completely unslavic. And so, again, this is something which we can map. And uh, again, we see that Slavic languages cluster. and also Hungarian goes together with them, whereas all other languages, including Upper Sorbian, which is a clear static outlier, uh, do something else. They allow at least motion verbs to, prefix motion verbs to be used imperfectively, and some languages allow even unprefixed motion verbs to be used imperfectively. And of course, there are many, many details regarding whether these are all verbs or only some verbs and what determines whether a particular verb can be used in this way but we have to abstract from these details in order to do typology. Typology is very crude. Um, so, Lausha, that's the answer to your question. Um, in many languages, it's, there is such thing as perfective present. Um, especially if we understand perfective and present as something of logic. Uh, in Russian, there is a perfective present, but it's used as a future. But in Czech, its cognate is not used as a future, but is used for other things like habitual expressions or as a historical. Um, and so, yeah. that's between. Um, if you want to say something like the rector usually writes an introduction to something. We use the perfective present. Rectorus parasho imada. 
uh, if you delete the prefix, it's going, it's going to mean something else. It will mean the rafter is busy writing. That's not the meaning of Rick Express. Um, in Russian, it doesn't work. If you translate it literally into Russian, then it can only denote the future. The rector will write an introduction. It can't mean the rector usually writes an introduction. So it's again, it's a matter of cross-linguistic formation and quite subtle one. Um, so it's that here, here we see the languages which allow the habitual use of the fact of the present. And here we clearly see uh, an east-west divide across Slavic. East Slavic languages and Balkan Slavic languages do not allow it, whereas West Slavic languages and also Baltic languages allow it, and the languages of the Caucasus are quite happy with it. And the next map shows the future use of the perfected present. And as you see, these maps overlap. They are not identical, but they overlap considerably. Well, with Slavic languages divided rather from north to south, from north to south, rather than from west to east. But uh, Czech and Slovak and Slovene can be both with their perfective presence, which means that these two uses are not a complementary distribution, as some scholars have actually said. Um, well, this is also worth mentioning, as I have said before, um, it's a whole lot of Slavic languages that you can't, really can't, it's completely ungrammatical to use a perfected verb or after a phasal predicate. A legitimate question is, is this a property common, well, a universal property common to all uh, languages with Slavic, Slavic strata structural systems? And it turns out that no, it isn't. Hungarian well, is reported to be happy with the prefix verbs of the basal verbs, but in this example from Itinska grammar, well, and all examples from Itinska grammar well, are, as far as I know, are, are examples from literature, not constructed. Um, and so here's the map. And you see. What you see is that with some caveats regarding the Caucasus, this ban on the use of perfective verbs with phasal predicates is a Slavic only feature. Um, so, yeah. Well, secondary imperfectivization is a very interesting thing. Um, the most interesting part is that it can be expressed morphologically as in Slavic and it can be expressed by syntactic means as in Hungarian where you postpose the prefer. Um, simplify things considerably here because in Hungarian you postpose the prefer not only for this purpose but sometimes you do it for this purpose as well um, with some verbs. And here's again a map, and it shows that there is a considerable, a considerable uh, cross-linguistic variation in this domain as well. With some languages, well, with, with all Slavic <coughs> languages having morphological subjectivization, <coughs> and most non-Slavic languages lacking it. But it creeps out somewhere like in Lithuanian, like in Hungarian, and admittedly in a set. And with some syntactic 
uh, secondary interfactorization also present with some languages in food power, so we have admittedly featuring both. Um, that on escape. And yo. So the multivariate topology clearly shows that uh, the managers examine very considerably with respect to all the examined parameters. And notably, in many cases, this variation cross-cut genealogical and aerial boundaries. In some cases, it can be argued that, that this particular feature is closely tied to ge genealogy or to a reality, but in other cases it's, it's different. So, you know, mm, a little bit of quantitative methods. Um, I have nothing really sophisticated to offer, something you have already seen plenty of uh, at the summer school and I'm sure elsewhere, neighborhood. Um, well, here's a neighbor that for um, 19 parameters, and what we see is that it's, it has some structure to it. It's not a, a round star diagram, which sometimes emerges with, it, it shows some clear clusters. And um, we have one cluster to the right, the Slavic cluster, which are all quite close to each other, with the exception of Upper Sorbia, which actually happens together with Lithuania and Latvia. And, well, it's, it's well known that Upper Sorbia is weird in terms of its special system and in terms of its, well, morphosyntax in general. The other cluster is the Cotinian one with a static, <coughs> also with a static as an outlier, but still close to, close to the Cotinian language. Not surprising. Um, however, other things which we see is that other languages are actually not really close either to each other or to, uh, to the two basic clusters. Uh, and this, so I think this diagram actually does reflect that relation which can be observed by just looking on, on the data and on the maps. Um, so there are two major clusters uh, of systems of prefixal perfectization which are defined by genealogical relationship rather than by area of proximity. That is Slavic with Soviet the networks and outlier and Cartesian with a setting close to it, but sufficiently distant from it, so at the same time. And other languages are somewhere in between. And, well, well what else I have done is I have applied the same method to the features rather than to languages. And Sergei Sai once told me that that's something one shouldn't do. Um, and then, actually, well, that's going to be the only really new thing I learned while preparing this presentation. Uh, I came across Michael Cecil's paper, one of the first papers dealing with cluster analysis of all these features, and it seems to me that he has done precisely what I did um, in my work 
So probably it's not as a legitimate uh, as one would think. And anyway, be it as it may, it does work. So that's the name of that of features. And again, we see clusters, and we see two outstanding clusters. Um, that's a cluster of features associated with Slavic languages. And that's the cluster of features associated with uh, Caucasian languages, and they, they are really distinct. Um, so, what is to be concluded from that is that, well, that isn't actually a Slavic star aspect. There are at least two types of professional professionalization. One is, well, Slavic style, and the other is Georgian style, so to say. And they are sufficiently distinct. They, well, yes, they are sufficiently similar, but on the other hand, they are sufficiently distinct and should be treated as distinct, at least for some purposes. Um, I'll skip this before that. We have no time. And I get here this I consider an important methodological point. Um, if you well, if you go to the slides with the neighbor nets, I'm not going to do it now, but you can do it yourself. Uh, and have a closer look at it at, at it. You will see that neighbor nets do not allow to determine clear aerial inferences. For instance, while neighborhoods show that Sorbian is distinct from Slavic, from the other Slavic languages, but it doesn't show uh, that it's sim actually similar to German. It shows that it's similar to Lithuanian, but it actually doesn't make much sense. Which means that contact and views change is actually not something which can be simply read off uh, name on a deal uh, Probably implying that contact and use change affects individual parameters rather than whole systems. Um, I think it's an important take home message. Um, so, are there, yeah, only 10 minutes, yeah, okay. Are there any burning questions so far? Yeah. I can wait and see if you have any. Well, I'll try. So, um, What's the name of the CISO's publication? Uh, there's a reference the list appended at the end of the presentation. Okay. Um, I will do more. Well, yeah, it looks like it's ready for some past questions. No. Thank you. Can we try? May I look? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so about your, your last point. I'm not sure I understand what Sirosha meant by saying it's, uh, it's not a legitimate to, yeah, uh, uh, to move it the other way around. But you, just can go back for a second to the slide. Make sure the feature cluster. Feature cluster. Okay. The problem is that so uh, my problem is, is that I'm very poor, I'm very bad at maths, <coughs> so I can't explain. What? I'm very bad at maths, so, okay. so I can't explain. But you show the maths, right? So we're just we're supposed to discuss it. So my problem with the with the feature cluster is that basically what you have. Can you show me the, the two uh, circles, the uh, the Slavic type and Georgian type? Yeah. So what you have here, I'm also very good at maths. I have maths, sorry. Uh, but my problem here, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but my problem here is that you have the Slavic prototype cluster on the left, the Caucasian prototype cluster on the right, and you're saying that's evidence, as far as I understood what you're saying, uh, for type, types of systems rather than aerial, uh, rather aerial grouping as in the previous map. But these two clusters are exactly aerial genealogical clusters and nothing else. So if you would have one of these clusters together, Caucasian languages at, let's say, I don't know, Lithuanian as opposed to, 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 to Slavic, mm -hmm. or, or uh, whatever else, and Slavic together with Ossetian and, uh, and, and Georgian in other way, then I would believe in the fact, in, in your argument that this 
map, this table that shows different types of processes. But otherwise, it's just a, a mirror reflection in a sense in, in different space of what you have in, uh, on uh, past remote language. So I'm not pretty well convinced with this uh, conclusion. Um, I'm not sure I can answer it shortly. So I, I think that well, the, the, short okay. well, the short answer is that um, Well, I, anyway, I consider these diagrams as something which can help me see patterns in the data and nothing more. Um, anyway, when I, when I, when I uh, determine um, this, the list of properties which are associated with what I call the slabbing prototype, the Caucasian prototype, I look not only not primarily at the diagrams, but rather at what I see in the languages. So it's sort of an ancillary thing rather than something which really which is which I consider really important. Um, may I go further? Yes. Um, I was just wondering where Adigate goes if you have the Slavic prototype and the Caucasian prototype. Well, it, mm, well, it, it goes nowhere. Um, it goes, well, it goes together with German for the simple reason that in such diagrams, outliers cluster. Adeke and Georgia are very different from everything else simply because they don't have prefixal characterization, mm -hmm. they have prefixes, but they don't have all the other stuff going together with prefixal characterization, and therefore they end up clustering together, which is sort of meaningless. But if you have, if I understand this diagram correctly, I'm unsure about that. You have two groups that cluster together, right? Uh, your, your Caucasian group and your Slavic group. So in between, you should have like, some kind of continuum of languages that are more similar to one group or more similar to the other. Well, yes. But mm -hmm. uh, Well the, fact, well, well, the fact that on this diagram, uh, a bigger German and Yiddish end up being more similar to Katwina languages than to Slavic languages is, well, it's something interesting, but it's something about which I would prefer to talk in qualitative terms rather than in mm -hmm. terms of such data. Mm -hmm. um, I think you should go on. If you yeah, well, other, other, well, well, we can decide that that's not here. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll talk. So, I'll actually... Oh. Okay. So, yeah. Actually, the most interesting part are uh, something which, for which our uh, time is never left. Um, the most important question is questions or what is the role of genealogical inheritance, um, language contact, and well, technological universals, if we believe in them, but in the rise and development of well, this landscape of structural systems. And which properties of these systems reflect internal developments and which are subject to error and confusion? And how we can address these questions? Well, we are lucky enough because at least some of these languages have some written history and some have relatives outside of the region, some have relatives with a considerable written history, etc. So we actually know more about, we, learn, we know something about uh, this history, 
uh, and don't have just to infer history from simple, as in most other places in Europe. Um, well, very briefly, in all the languages under investigation, the systems of proverbs and coding special meanings are inherited from previous public times. So, Slavic, Baltic, and other Indo-European proverbs go back to the proto indo european world settlements. Hungarian proverbs find counterparts in the old Ulrich global satellites and have been claimed to go to the front of the Uzbek, at least. Um, and finally, Katmian proverbs are attested because they close down and some of them reconstruct the proto Katmian. That's one thing. But that's not a whole story because while on the one hand this implies that this sum and potentially many prerequisites for the development of the pixel perfectionization and all these attached systems have been present in the languages in question prior to any possible contact they could engage in. Um, however, um, however, the fact is that in all these languages, again, in all these languages, the use of proverbs as perfect devising devices is clearly a late innovation. Um, therefore, we can't help any of concluding that, uh, that genealogical inheritance cannot be the only factor. And so we end up in a very complex situation of having to somehow tease apart on topological tendencies, like a very well known and uh, well attested tendency for verbal satellites to become perfectivizers by well attested grammaticalization scenarios and language contact and error of the few. Um, and while I really don't have time, and I have plenty of, actually plenty of things to say about it, uh, and many examples. Um, well, a couple of things, just a couple of things. I, 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 I will have to, to take a couple of minutes, probably five minutes from the coffee break. Very sorry. Um, well, if we examine, if we examine the attested, documented cases of contact induced developments of proverbs and proposal perfectivization, we find that even in situations of prolonged and very intense language contact, borrowing tends to be limited to formally transparent and semantically loaded features such as proverbs themselves and some of their uses, but it's well what could be called global copying of a special system as a whole is not attested. There aren't there isn't a single language which has taken over uh, a Slavic a spectral system as a whole and has become Slavic in terms of an aspect, not being Slavic in other terms. Even Eastern Romania, which is a very special case and which I discussed in slightly more detail in this paper, Eastern Romania is actually very different any kind of static. Um, so that's a long story about the core causes, uh, skip it anyway. Um, <coughs> so actually I come to my conclusions. Um, so the distribution of professional perfectives in the languages of Central and Eastern Europe and the core causes um, involves a very complex interplay of genetic inheritance on the one hand, contact induced development on the other hand, and necessarily some universal technological tendencies. Um, and 
these three are very hard to tease apart, but they have to be teased apart in order to come up with a realistic picture of what has happened. And importantly though, well, aerial on the surface, if we just look at the map, uh, the distribution of the pixel perspectives cannot be attributed to any single center of elevation and spread. Notably, it doesn't all go to Slavic, all go back to Slavic. And rather, there are at least two mutually independent centers of development. That is the Golden Slavic and the Caucasus. And that is, as I showed in the part of the presentation I have to skip, that is no reasonable way to, to claim that there has been something between them which has which underlies this similarities. Um, and still, in the other part of the presentation, I had to skip. There is a pocket of similar languages somewhere in China, with no contact to whatever of this kind. So, professional perfectization is something rare, but something which can happen from time to time in different places. Um, and importantly, clues of possible contact induced developments are to be sought not in the easy to grab grammatical features. If you see well, if you see very similar grammars or no, if you see superficially similar grammars, this actually means nothing. Um, you have to dig really hard in order to, to prove that that, uh, that has been uh, conduct-induced change because conduct-induced change operates with well, tiny bits and pieces such as uh, lexical meanings or particular uses of, uses of particular morphemes rather than with very broad and very abstract grammatical, grammatical features, which can be seen on the surface. And that's all. Thank you. And that's the great culture of the